We've been editing video for over nine years and between our three YouTube channels, we've had to learn how to make our post-production workflow be as efficient as possible. So we've decided to create a video editing for YouTube masterclass of sorts covering our process and time-saving tips and tricks that we've learned along the way. Before we start, we do edit in Adobe Premiere, but a lot of these tips on our workflow and even our quick keys can be adapted to whatever editing software that you use. We also have the video divided into chapters, so feel free to hop around to find exactly what you're looking for. And we'll be working on a Dell Precision 5820, which reminds me, thanks to Dell for sponsoring this video and for sending us this killer computer. First, we like to copy the clips off of our cameras to a drive that's separate from our operating system. For optimal performance, this could be another internal solid state drive or an external one. Often we use external USB-C solid state drives and they've worked quite well. For the folder structure, we first start with the project folder. Then inside this folder, we can create a few more folders. One for footage, one for Premiere project files, one for After Effects, and one for audio and music. If we have a photo shoot that goes along with the video, we'll create photo specific folders for the files and the Lightroom catalog. The point here is to keep your footage and assets organized in a way that makes sense to you. The footage gets copied to the, well, you guessed it, the footage folder. Now on our external drives, we like to keep a folder for commonly used assets and templates. So we have a Premiere Pro project template for Mango Street and a slightly different one for mine, and Rachel has her own on her hard drive. We keep a collection of sound effects, graphics, and a few of our music tracks we use for our end card and ad spots all right here. For a Mango Street video, I'll just copy our template project, head over to our new project folder, and paste it into the Premiere folder. Then I'll rename it based on the project and then open it up. Here we have five folders. The footage folder, currently empty, the audio folder with a music folder and a sound effects folder inside, and a VO folder, which again is empty and used only if we record VO separately from our video footage. The graphics folder has some commonly used graphics like this arrow and this animated texture. And then we have a subfolder of end card graphics. Since we make a ton of photography videos, we usually need a dedicated folder for our photos that we show in the videos. And since we have bills to pay, we have a couple of our sponsor spots and the ad break graphics in here. So that's our structure for Mango Street and the one for my personal channel is pretty similar. I just added a dedicated folder for screen recordings and I have a few different default graphics in there as well. Our goal is to have it organized well enough where another editor could step into the project and understand where to find everything. Once you have everything set up with your commonly used assets and a folder structure that keeps things clean and organized, just go ahead and save as and name it something like Premiere Template 2021. In our case, we can save it to our template folder on our external solid state drive. And real quick, let me show you our project settings. For our scratch disks, we keep everything located in the same place as our project, except for the video and audio previews. We keep these on another internal solid state drive separate from our operating system. That way it spreads out the throughput of data between multiple fast storage options. If you don't have a second internal drive, that's okay. You can store it on your system drive or with your project. So truly, one of the key things that you need to not pull your hair out when editing video is a computer that can handle it. We're working on this Dell Precision 5820, which is a freaking powerhouse. For video editing, you really do want a good balance of CPU, GPU, and RAM. And what's great about this computer for us as big Adobe users is that they use Adobe recommended configurations, so it's optimized for the work that a lot of video editors and motion graphics artists do. So the CPU is really gonna help the editing software just perform better. This computer is loaded with an Intel Xeon 3.5 gigahertz CPU, which is 0.5 gigahertz faster than the processor in our iMac Pro. And enough RAM is vital as well, since your editing software is gonna to wanna to use a lot of it, and the higher resolution your footage is, the more that RAM is gonna help you out. We've got 128 gigabytes of RAM in this computer, which really helps the system run really fast. One of the last key pieces of hardware is the graphics card. With this system, we have the NVIDIA RTX 5000, which has 16 gigs of GPU memory, and helps take some of the processing load from the CPU and is especially useful when playing back footage and adding effects. A few other things to note about the Dell system is that it gives you the capacity to expand. If you wanna add new hardware down the line, like attach additional internal hard drives, you can do that really simply. Also, this tower is designed to keep the components cool so the system doesn't overheat because other computers may slow down to help combat overheating, which is exactly what you don't want to happen when you've got to wrap up a video edit. That's the system we're on. So next, let's talk about editing and how you can do it faster. By far, the one thing that will really speed up your editing is by implementing useful keyboard shortcuts. 
We'll cover a few of our most used ones and we'll upload our keyboard shortcut file on our website so you can download it for free if you wanna use it. First, you're likely gonna be zooming in and out a lot. So we use the one key to zoom out and the two key to zoom in. Just having one key to press instead of a combination of two is well worth it. Next, ripple trim to previous playhead is our Q key. This will remove anything on the clip to the left of the playhead. W is the ripple trim next edit to playhead and it removes anything on the clip to the right of the playhead. We're gonna show you this in action in a minute, but you should definitely set these ripple shortcuts up. So another useful one is Y, which is add a frame hold, which creates a freeze frame on the selected clip. Oh, that's a good tip, I didn't know that. <laughs> S is the track select forward tool, which selects everything to the right of where you click. So you can easily move things over to give you more room to build out and edit. And then L is shuttle right, which is essentially fast forward. J is shuttle left or rewind, and K is shuttle stop, which just stops playback. Okay, let's use these in action, but first let's talk about layout. So here's how we have our Premiere windows laid out. Our project window is in the top left with all of the footage and the assets. To the right, we have our effect controls and another tab with essential sound and essential graphics. Next is our source window and in another tab is Lumetri color. To the right of that is the program monitor which displays what's on our timeline. The bottom left has our effects window uh, to the right of that are two extensions that utilize Essential Graphics. The first is Premiere Composer by Mr. Horse. This has animated backgrounds, animated text templates, and other motion graphics that can save you a lot of time and helps you add some polish to your videos. I believe you can actually download it and use the starter pack for free, which is pretty cool. And I have another collection of animated graphics called MoPack. Then we have our toolbar, our timeline, and our audio meters. Most of our YouTube videos have some sort of talking head portion like this, so we always start our edit there. Since we film those clips at 4K and 24 frames per second, we want our timeline to match that, so we'll just drag that clip to the new item icon. This creates a sequence with the exact settings that we want, so we have nothing else to worry about there. All we have to do is just rename the sequence. And I also like to lower the playback resolution here to half, just so I can edit as quickly as possible. The most common way to start an edit for something like a YouTube video is to start with the talking head portion. If you don't talk to camera and instead do a voiceover, you can start with the audio clip instead, but we just need to chop it down, cut out mistakes, and just get it tight. There's lots of mistakes. I always start by adjusting the track's height because by default, they're pretty short. So just hold shift over this area to increase the size. We can do the same for audio. Now I can actually see what's going on. So the way I record for my channel is I have a microphone like this, plugged directly into the camera in one input, and then for the other input, I set it so it uses the same input as input one's source, and I just lower the input gain on input two. So it's the same thing, just one has lower volume. So since I film by myself, I won't easily catch it if I clip the microphone by speaking too loudly. And if I do, I can just use the second input, which has this mic at a lower volume. Did you say that you have your own channel? Is that what you've been doing most mornings? Yeah. Now this is kind of specific to my setup, but if you have the option, it's a pretty good way to do things. What that means for me in Premiere though, is that in the left channel, I'm one volume and in the right channel, I'm at a lower volume, which is, sounds pretty weird. So if my left channel, which is input one on my camera, if that audio is clean, I will use only that audio. And I'll do that by right clicking the clip, choosing audio channels and select the L box instead of the R box. Now it's set up correctly. So next let's go over the ripple trim, which if you remember is Q and W on our keyboard. If I don't start talking until here, I wanna delete everything to the left of the playhead marker and move the rest of the clip to the left so there just is no gap. I'll just press Q and boom, that portion is deleted and now it starts exactly where it should. Now I'm gonna play through and look for the next mistake or spot that needs to be tightened up. If I flub this next line, I will cut the clip right after the line previous. Pressing C on my keyboard makes a cut across the clip. Then I will quickly scrub to the spot with the right delivery and just before it, I will press Q again. This deletes everything in between. You should do a quick little picture of Flubber. Oftentimes I find by scrubbing through and looking at the audio waveform, I can find spots where I repeat a line. Scrubbing through quickly like this is so much faster than playing the clip back in real time, especially if you mess up a lot like I do. Let's say I found the next good take. I'll cut the clip right before I start speaking. Then I can go back to the previous line and press W and now everything to the right up until that cut gets removed and that space gets deleted. Now only our good takes are here snug up against each other. So once you're comfortable with your quick keys, editing will start to become second nature. I will then play it back in real time to make sure my cuts are clean. 
Sometimes just adding or removing one or two frames between cuts can make a huge difference. Make sure you aren't cutting off any of the beginning or end of your audio because that won't sound great. You should cut off the end of your grate right there. That won't sound great. Now that the structure of the video is cut together, we can move on to adding B-roll and graphics. Using B-roll can accomplish a few things. It should provide relevant visuals for what you're talking about. It breaks up your talking ad section to keep viewers engaged. It can also be used to adjust your pacing. So the first two are pretty obvious, but you may find after you've chopped up your talking ad section that it's just you talking without any breaks or pauses for like 10 minutes and it's a bit overwhelming. Use B-roll over sections that need a little breathing room and then move the rest of the clips over. This is where the track select forward tool really comes in handy. Click on the clips that you wanna to move to the right, then you can switch back to your selection tool and then hold shift and click on anything you don't wanna to move to deselect it and drag everything over. Uh, we use this tool all the time. Let me just play you this example, first without any breathing room, and then with a little breathing room. In general, this seems like a very solid company that's only getting bigger and better. On the chart, they're off of their high. Very solid company that's only getting bigger and better. On the chart, they're off of their highs in February of 283. Sometimes you just need to give the viewer a moment to allow the information to sink in, so that technique should help you accomplish that. Now let's go over some graphics. We mentioned before that we use Premiere Composer and Mopac for some nice templates. So if we want to create a title frame introducing a new section, we'll start by grabbing the background and dropping it in. These cost about $40, but we use them like every week, so it's well worth it for us. Then we can change the color palette or use custom colors. Next, we'll grab a text template and drag that on top of the background. Then we can change the text and customize the font. Let's see how that looks. That was super simple to do. The major drawback is that it can be pretty intensive on your computer, so less powerful systems may struggle. Not our Dell Precision 5820 though. I used to create all the animated text and motion graphics in After Effects and then bring that into Premiere, and sometimes I still do that, but this just saves me so much more time. Another time-saving tip is to use presets. An obvious use of a preset may be for your color grade. So in our graphics folder, we have an adjustment layer called LUT. We'll just drag that down on top of our video and stretch it out for the entire duration. So for my set, I have a go-to color grade that I developed using the Lumetri color panel. So with my LUT layer selected, I'll just go to my presets. My color grade preset is called Dan PF MS Blue V2. So I'll just double click it to add it to the LUT layer. We can see it loaded up Lumetri color in our effects control window. So let's flip over to the Lumetri color tab. You can also find it under window, Lumetri color. So my color grade preset does a very subtle adjustment to the white balance. And then in the creative tab, you can see it loads up our blue LUT from our LUT collection. It already has the intensity set exactly where I want it. And I also have a curves adjustment already done to add some contrast into the image. Once you have your color grade set up in Lumetri, how you like it, just right click Lumetri in the effects controls panel and then choose save preset. We also use presets for punching in on our talking heads. If we want to avoid a jump cut or punch in for emphasis, normally you'd select the clip, then adjust the scale and the position in the effect controls. That can get tedious to do every single time, so you might as well make a preset out of it. Start by adjusting the scale and the position that works for your video, and then just right click on motion and choose save preset. Now, if I'm editing my video and find a spot I wanna punch in, I just cut the clip and drag and drop the preset onto that clip. Boom, done. Once you've got the edit nearly complete, it's time to do a little audio mix. First, I'm gonna go to edit, preferences, timeline. Here, I'm gonna change the audio transition default duration to two frames and then I'll click OK. Then I wanna select all the talking head audio without the video. Just hold Alt or Option and click and drag over the audio clips to select them. Now you can press Control or Command T to apply the default transition, which will be a two frame audio fade. This helps smooth out any clicks or pops in the audio in between those cuts. Then let's go to the audio track mixer. 
Click this arrow to open up the insert effects for each track. There are a few simple things you can do here to help your audio sound better. The first one would be adding some compression to your voice. We'll go to Amplitude and Compression and select Single Band Compressor. Then just double click it to open it. Under presets, you can start with the voiceover preset. This evens out the dynamic range of your voice, so if some words are said more quietly, they'll be easier to hear. You can add more compression by bringing the threshold level to the left, or decrease the amount of compression by bringing the threshold to the right. In this video, I'm gonna cover five stocks that I'm watching right now that I think have a great potential. And if you have a lot of sibilance in your voice, especially with your S's, you can also add a de -esser. They have presets for male and female and the type of de you want to do. Bring the threshold to the left so you start seeing some gain reduction during areas with lots of sibilance. If you lower the threshold too low, you may start to sound like you have a lisp, so try and find the happy medium where it's toning down the sibilance without removing too much. Now that I think have a great potential for growth and maybe they're ones that you may wanna take a closer look at as well. Then finally over to the right is your master audio track and that's where all your audio gets routed through. So here you could add something like a multiband compressor to really take your audio mix to the next level. The multiband compressor lets you apply individual compression settings to different frequency bands, but if that all sounds too confusing, just try flipping through the built-in presets to see if you find something that you like. You can adjust the output gain so that your audio isn't too loud. And I usually look for my audio meter to max out at negative six decibels at the loudest. That means my music tracks are also set at negative six when they're at their loudest and usually much quieter during the video to ensure that it's not too distracting or jarring. Once your audio is mixed to your liking, it's time to export. So we've experimented with several different export settings for Premiere, but here's a method that we've found that looks great and is easy to set up. Since we're editing 4K for YouTube, we'll start with a preset based off YouTube's own recommendations. Then we'll just check the box for render at maximum depth. And then we'll also click the box for use maximum render quality. And then we'll click export. Just for fun, let's compare the export time between our iMac Pro and this Dell Precision 5820. Well, our iMac Pro exported this 10 minute 4K video in 21 minutes and 26 seconds. This Dell Precision 5820 exported the same clip with the same settings in 15 minutes and 13 seconds. What are you gonna do with all of your extra time? Probably travel. Thank you so much for watching. We really hope that this video gave you some insight into our editing process and also gave you some tips that can help you edit much better and faster. Thanks again to Dell for sponsoring this here video. To learn more about Dell Precision with NVIDIA RTX, click the link in our description. Do us a favor, hit the thumbs up button on this video. Consider subscribing to our channel if you haven't already. And anything else? Nothing else today, that's, that's it. Just, okay, see you in the next one.